Welcome to the R video tutorial, Quant Mod Part 3. This time we're going to learn how to bootstrap forecast via Quant Mod. Actually, we're going to use Quant Mod to get us the returns, and then we'll just bootstrap it ourselves and see what these forecast uh, trajectories might look like. Uh, in the next video, we'll look at some other things that we can do with this. So, a lot of this is just review, but we're going to get rolling here because I have a fresh run uh, instance of R running. So I'm going to read the library quant mod, which you should already be familiar with from the last video. I'm going to read it in. I'm going to get our weekly returns from this all at once. Uh, and now we're going to plot them through time, plot the stock, which is Apple. And you can see this is the plot of the returns. I'm not really interested in the plot of the returns right now. I'm interested in the histogram because this is the essential idea of bootstrapping is that our histogram here or our empirical distribution is what can really happen in the future. So what we've seen in the past is exactly what can happen in the future and in the same frequency. So this is what bootstrapping is about. We pull from the distribution. We don't have to make any parametric assumptions like it's a normal distribution or a T distribution or some other distribution that you may have never heard of. We can just say the empirical distribution is what we're going to use. All right, so I'm going to grab from the data set the last value. I'm going to need this quite often. So because when I create the forecast trajectories, I need to know where to start. So I need to start where I stopped, right? Okay, so I'm going to do this. You can look at the value. It's a time series value, so I'll play with it later. But if you wanted to, you could say, what is the value? Okay, and you can see it's 187.18. Okay, so we're going to need this later. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put a picture up of the results from bootstrapping, and then I'm going to comment through the code that I've already written. But what I've got right here is sort of a dumb window. Uh, that I've created to hold our results once we get the results. Okay, so here I have plot. It's a null plot, meaning I don't have any data for it and I don't need any. I'm going to specify the x limits and the y limits. I'm going to give it a label for time along the x axis and the y label is going to be apple value. I've made this wide enough to hopefully capture all the result trajectories I might see. And this is due to the time of the year that is. We have weekly data. And now it's July, so we're going to have 2018.5, right? That's about when July starts halfway through the year. And we're going to go out 2.7, uh, which is about the end of a quarter. So just keep that in mind uh, as we go along here when we're doing this. So half the year to about three quarters of the year. We can actually put 0.75 in there if we wanted to. Uh, I have an AB line statement here and I'm using the value that I have up above. So what this is going to do is this is going to say this is the last value I left off at. Okay, And if I run this you'll see what we get here. It's going to be pretty boring of a picture. Straight line, flat, boring. It's blue if you like blue. Uh, and that's about as exciting as it gets. Uh, so what I have here is another value that I may be interested in. Supposedly, uh, and I didn't do this, uh, but suppose I bought the Apple stock at 150. I want to see, is it going to go below that in the time frame that I'm talking about in like the next 12 weeks? So now I have my threshold here. Well, I'm going to call it a threshold that if I cross it, then I lose money right? And most people don't like losing money. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so the idea of bootstrapping is, is you repeatedly sample from a population and you use that distribution and, or analyze the data for each and use the distribution generated to create your inferences or your predictions. So here I'm going to run this in a loop, but first I'm just going to run it one at a time so you can see what happens. So I'm going to use the sample function here. And let's put in some comments so that you can catch up. So comments. So sample from the empirical distribution of returns. Okay. So the sample function is going to pull out from our returns. And notice I had to use as vector. So you might want to put that uh, here as dot vector is needed since it, these the actual returns are our time series.
and you say, well, what's the big deal? Okay, there shouldn't be a big deal. Well, what R is going to do is it's going to actually put them in order. So the the returns will occur in a certain order, and I'm just saying I want to independently sample from it. So time doesn't matter, and the order doesn't matter. And if I use it as a time series when I use the sample function, it's going to still keep them in order, which I don't want it to do. Okay, the next number is 12. This is how many I'm going to pull out of there. And I'm going to use replace equals true so that it gives me independent samples. So every time, every value is equally likely to be sampled. And so I can have repeats. So uh, if I didn't want repeats and I want to do something like simple random sampling where there is no replacement, I would make that equal to false. So let's put a comment here. Replace equals true gives us equal probability at each time. So once a value has been pulled, it can be pulled again. So each sampling time. So we could get repeats. So if I were to run this from my data here, I'm going to run this, write it into return1.sample. Okay. And then I could look at it if I want to. So I can just type in here return one sample. And I can see this is the sample of my returns. I go negative, I go negative, positive, positive, negative, 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 and so on. Um, but these alone are not useful. So I need to actually turn them into something that I can use. And if you remember, this is going to be compound uh, returns. This isn't simple returns. This is compounding returns. So we don't just simply add this on or multiply this on. We have to do one plus that. So... I'm going to put here, do the one plus trick for returns in order to turn them into a real value. And for the compounding, I need to remember for compounding that I have to re multiply these together uh, is the reason here. Compounding is the reason for cum prod, which is a cumulative product. And you'll see what this does here in just a second. So let's run this and see what we get. And then we'll run the next one and see what we get. So return to dot sample. You see, these are now numbers that I had before, but they're around one. If it's below one, then I'm losing money. If it's above one, then I'm making money. If you look here, I'm losing money a lot. Okay. But when I compound that, that's really going to change things as well. So if I run this little bit and look at return three SAMP, you can see that I actually lose a lot of money, right? Negative, 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 negative. I have 91% of the value I started with. Oh my gosh. I'm down to 78% of the value that I started with. So I might panic on this particular trajectory, but that's okay. Because this is what we want to know is, am I going to lose money? And where might I lose money? Okay, so then what I need to do is use that value one again. So multiply this by the last value in the data set. To turn it back to an actual value. So that's all this does. And if I run this, I called it value two now because it's an actual value versus a return. So here, value two, you can see these are the value. And look, oh my gosh, I'd be panicking because I go below my 150. That's what this red line is over here. Like, oh my gosh, I'm losing money. I'm losing money. But at the end of it, I'm really not at the low, but Still, people panic over money. Uh, I do. Everybody does. All right. So the next thing we want to do is turn it into a time series so we can actually plot this thing. So turn it into a time series. Okay. So here I use the TS function, which is going to turn it into a time series. This is my data set that I'm going to turn it into. Now, it's already a vector. So it doesn't have a start time. So I'm giving it a start time. I'm going to say it's going to start in 2018, comma 26. Okay, so I'm in currently at the beginning of July in 2018. And my frequency is 52, meaning it's weekly data. Okay, so the 26 is about halfway through the year. So it's telling me to start it at about halfway through the year. So if I were to run this, this is just going to turn it into a time series so that I can use it. So we can look at this as we go through here. 
And you can see that it's going to end in the 37th week of 2018. And here are the values that I had before. And notice I'd be freaking out. And then I'm going to use a line statement so that it plots it on my picture. So that's my trajectory. So I started here and notice I've been on a downhill slide until the very end. Uh, really probably panicking a lot, uh, but don't look at your stock that much if you're going to panic a lot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop through this a thousand times and I'm going to plot every single trajectory so that I can see what might happen, right? Because this is what bootstrapping is about. What might happen given the returns that we have? So you're going to run this. It'll take it a second or two to run and then it'll plot the picture out, which is really what we're interested in. Okay. So here's all the trajectories laid on there. And you notice that it kind of cones out fans out into sort of a cone sort of shape. And this is really what we're interested in is what is this going to look like in the future? Notice there's a lot of times it goes below my 150, but there's a lot of times that it's way above it. So that's really what I'm, I want to do is pay attention to that value. And there's lots of ways to do this uh, in order to make it look pretty. Uh, here I just put lines on here. You can uh, do some crazy thing like if you want to get it multicolored, which I'm not sure how it will actually look here. But you could do color equals I because we have an index I up here. And I could run it again if I wanted to. Uh, and it will just make it multicolored instead of just a black blob. Okay, uh, and this can be useful, uh, but right now I'm just trying to get you used to it. So there's, you know, the Technicolor version of this. Um, I particularly don't really care, probably don't like black, but anyway, you can see the trajectories that happen. And remember, this is random sampling, so don't expect the same answer every single time. But what you can expect is if you do a big enough sample size that the samples that you get will be pretty close to what uh, the true distribution will be. All right, so we're going to stop here and we're going to pick up in the next video and try to look at when we would go below our 150 threshold, which makes us panic. All right, so let's move on to the next video. Thank you.